good to be back. Last week, I really missed you guys. Mom and uh, Granny are still ill. Mom apparently has got some sort of congestion with the virus or something that keeps just reattacking her. So keep her in your prayers. You know, one of the key tactics that the enemy used with the third of the angels and then again with Adam and Eve and he does it with us is to attack our faith. And faith is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And we know by scripture that we're only approved through faith, by having faith. And I've always marveled even from a young child of the faith of Abraham and the faith of Joseph that never wavered. Because I knew by, even when I didn't really want to admit it, I knew by my character, I, straight, I would have to be straightened out. I'd always have the wrong attitude at times. I would doubt, I'd gripe, I'd throw a fit, like a little temper tantrums. But then I would read those stories and, and, and marvel at how you can just start from fresh and have unwavering, even Job, you know, almost his whole entire time he was going through those trials, no matter what assailed him, he had confidence, he had faith in God. And I, unfortunately and sadly, I have to admit that over the years I can see so many times I've been less uh, strong in that way. It didn't take too much to rattle my faith at times. And it's a shame because, you know, it took him revealing it by his own hand to get me solid in the fact that I know now I'm in God's hands. If I'm destroyed, if I'm not destroyed, whatever goes on in the day, good or bad, that he's in, even if I've done something to open the door, he's still merciful. He knows my heart. And we're going to look over in Hebrews and starting chapter 11. I think of, you know, so many that were like doubting Thomas, how it broke him once, you know, he said, oh, unless I put my hand in his flesh, in his hands, in the wounds in his hands, and he thrust my hand in his side, I won't believe it's really him. But then when Jesus said here, it broke him. And he said, no, Lord, it's you. And he said, go ahead, here. You know, how, how he must have really felt temporarily ashamed. But the loving Father, Jesus, would never leave us in shame. In fact, it says whenever he was facing his trials that he despised the shame. Because shame, as I think it was Brian in one time in Bible study, I, I believe it was, said that, Shame will separate us from the presence of God. It'll keep us from going to the presence of God. And any one of us here that knows that, oh, this week I've blown it, I've acted like a fool or whatever it is, when you come in Friday night, the enemy tries to put that on your mind. You, should, you don't belong here. You shouldn't be praising. He doesn't want to hear your praise. He, and he's very crafty because he makes it think that it's your, your thoughts or his thoughts, that what are you doing before me kind of situation. And that's not the case. As I mentioned in my prayer last night, he never repented from calling David a man after God's own heart. Even when David was taking someone else's wife, conspiring this plot to cover it up, even to the point of sending him a very faithful servant with his own death sentence to the general, whatever general it was, you know, he still had faith in David. He still loved David. He would still be faithful to David no matter what. God never repented the calling because he knew the moment he had Nathan say, you're that man, he knew immediately David would be broken and David would repent. And it would be true repentance. It wouldn't be like when Saul, when Samuel came before Saul, Samuel and God both knew Saul's going to do what the people want. If he, gives, if he spares him this time and keeps him king, he's going to do it again. If the people want something, he's going to bow and give in. Let us not be those that lose faith, because that's what, exactly what Saul did. Samuel didn't show up on time. The people were murmuring. He lost faith. 
he lost the complete trust in God and through the prophet. And so he interceded and he jumped the gun, <clears throat> even to the fact that he didn't destroy everything that the Lord had told him to destroy. Verse 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up. I always marveled at Enoch. He lived such a pure life that he didn't have to see death. God just took him. To live that pure, that's my, that's my desire, to live purely before the Lord. To not have regrets. To not look back each week and say, I've stumbled, I've, I've fallen weak, I've damaged the testimony, damaged the witness. You know, we all, we all make mistakes, but it should be our heart's earnest desire to be so pleasing before Him at all times that we don't have regrets at the end of the week, each week, every day. We shouldn't be worried so much about tomorrow because we got enough problems dealing with our own selves in that day. Praise God. But Enoch, he didn't see death. He was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before he has been taken up, he was pleasing to God. It saddens me that so many, their true, when you really see their true fruits, they don't really care about being pleasing to God. They want, they're, they're happy with serving God so long as it benefits them. And that's not everybody. It, but the vast majority out here, that is the case. Once you show them through the word in love that something they're doing is amiss, immediately see, you see a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde flip. Who are you to judge me? My Jesus wouldn't. Well, you, you don't know how true that is. Your Jesus apparently is not the right Jesus because Jesus was true. Jesus told them, if you love me, you will follow me. You will do the things that I do. You will mimic my steps. Even Paul said, you follow our example only if we follow Christ. If you don't see us following Christ, you don't follow that example. One of the guys down there at Tucker was on the rocks, and I said, you look at Christ. If you're looking over here, you're, you're putting someone else above Christ. You're putting them on a pedestal. They're going to fall. And, while, and then he admitted while he was looking at these people that he called his equals or mentors or someone he put confidence in, and he saw them off and he was accusing them, then he found himself way over here doing something he didn't have no business doing. I said, it only works if you keep Jesus as your focus. How many times have I stumbled because I put something that day ahead of God, got my attention off of being his servant first? <clears throat> And then found myself giving in to my temper or giving in to some wrong attitude. Verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. He's faithful. His word, he's never a liar. His word will be fulfilled. He tends us so carefully. I was, I've been researching certain crafts, whether it's making glass or, or purifying metal or forging. You think, oh, that's brute force heating up a piece of metal and beating it out. But it's not. It takes, depending on what you're trying to craft, it takes a precise, you could ruin a blade if you're trying to make a blade, for instance. If you get it too hot or you leave it too soft or you cool it too fast, it can, it can crack, it can weaken. No matter, or even a hammer. You can have a too soft hammer, or you can have one when you smash another obstacle, it, a nail or whatever it is, that thing's going to bust because you made it too brittle. It's a fine art, and he's 
watching. He's the one that blows the coals. I remember whenever he talked to Joshua the, there in Zechariah, he said, are you not the firebrand I plucked? You're my firebrand. And he told the enemy to hush, stop the lies. And he dressed him in righteous robes of Christ. And we know that's Christ's robes. Verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned by God about those things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he con condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Now I know, according to what we see in this world now, he didn't go 120 years without somebody speaking a bunch of ill stuff towards him. Oh, this crazy man, look at this fool. What is this? What is rain? They hadn't even seen rain. And some of the people probably were helping him at one point and then turned aside, turned away. But it, he never relented. He continued faithfully the 120 years. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. As Pastor has mentioned, historical facts are that that was one of the greatest cities probably of all time. One of the most rich, lavish cities. I mean, you think of the hanging gardens of Babylon, but if you predate that all the way back to Abraham's time, Ur was far advanced above its time. So many people out here want luxury. They want God. We've heard it on the radio. If you're not having the newest and best of things, you're not, you've done something wrong. God's favorite child's going to have the newest and best. Going to live in the lap of luxury. I remember that video he shared about the green pastures. You know, and when we were going out west, me and Jody, I, I asked him why they got the cows grazing. He said, that actually, those, those little few blades of grass has more nutritional value than my field does with all the lush grass three feet tall because they have to starve for water to the point when water hits them, they're rich in nutrients. So yes, you have to have a wider spread to have cattle, but they get more nutritional value from the little tufts of grass where they are. And I thought that just amazing that, you know, he doesn't want us to get lazy. He doesn't want us to get fat and not want to go anywhere unhealthy. He wants us to move with him and go from place to place. And it's not always roses. It's always, sometimes it's rocky. Sometimes it's perilous. There's dangers out there. It's hot. It's cold at night. I always heard it said until I went out there and we were on the south rim of the Grand Canyon. I didn't realize how cold the desert type areas could be. But they can be cold. There's nothing blocking the wind. It's just going to plummet. He protects us and He keeps us safe and He wants us to follow Him grow in the nutrients of Him. Verse 9, By faith He lived as an alien in the land of promise, as a, in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For He was looking for a city which foundations whose architect and builder was God. By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she had considered her him fruit faithful who promised. It wasn't until she had faith in him and knew he was faithful that, uh, that she bore the child. And you remember, she was younger, much younger, when he originally gave the promise. And I always thought it marveled. You waited, you thought you was unable to do it then. Then you get 10, 20 years later and now, now you're able to do it. It's kind of the reverse, don't you think? But it took that long for her to build that trust and faith in her father. He wants us to have that faith that will, like a father that hasn't shown a child that they can't trust him. If you put them on the bunk and say jump, they're going to jump. They're not going to doubt it. They're going to jump. It's until you prove otherwise, our Father will never prove otherwise. Our Heavenly Father is always going to be there to catch us. Verse 12, Therefore also there was born of one man, and him as good as dead as that, as many descendants as stars of the heaven innumerable, 
and in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore, he qualified himself to be the lineage from which Christ would come, the father of Isaac, the son of promise. He was qualified through his faith. In fact, whenever you see him fixing a plunge, the knife into Isaac, God stopped him and said, now I know you will not withhold. You trust me. Now I know you trust me. It's basically what he's saying. Now I know that you will not withhold anything because you know I'm true. I will keep my word. And that's one thing he said is whether he raises him or whether he stays my hand, I know his promise will be fulfilled. That's how he could do it. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. They would have been like Lot's wife. As vile as that place was, she was at a place that she was willing to turn back. Even with the order, the command, don't look back. Even to the fact when Adam and Lot, or Abraham and Lot were together, he said, which two lands do you want? And what did, what did Lot pick? He picked the luxurious little a oasis with all the lush grass and you didn't have to do anything and no rocks and no cliffs and we see what happened to his family they saved them but look what happened to his family Abraham went out not knowing you know how he was going to provide for his family really and we see what happened to him even to the fact that he had to save Lot and the king of Sodom and Gomorrah Verse 16, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. If you're faithful, if you know, truly know, and hold on to the fact that he's not a liar, there's nothing he's going to put before you that you can't bear through him, through his power, and love him undyingly. You know, Michael's made it a point. What else option do we have? We've already taken the, we've already counted the cost. We've already thrown our lot in with him. We've enlisted. We weren't drafted. There's a difference. Enlisting means you volunteer yourself to go through whatever torturous training you have to go through. Drafting is they make you do it. They press gang you into it. We enlisted to Christ. We need to stay faithful to that. And we need to remind ourselves constantly of his word like he says in closing Hebrews 12, verse 1. We, we will not be approved if we doubt him. He convinced a third of God's angels before sin was even instituted that he wasn't truthful, that he wasn't faithful, that he was lying to them and turn their hearts against their creator. He did the same thing with Adam and Eve and all mankind. He's done it to us. He's let us see the circumstances like Peter, see the storm waves to where we say, well, are you really there? We even see when Daniel was withstood stood 21 days of hearing his prayer answered, he was on the rocks. But he didn't doubt him, but he was on the, he's on the rocks. And he had Michael open the way for Gabriel to go to him and said, your answer's on the way. Don't, don't doubt him. Your answer's on the way. Some of the most faithful men have been shaken on the precipice because the enemy was able to instill doubt in their minds, to lose faith in their father. Verse 1 of chapter 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, 
who for the joy set before him endured the cross. That was us. That was us being restored to the Father. That was the joy. That's why the three times he prayed in the garden, he still took the cup. He said, your will be done. I could probably do it some other way as far as not having to go through this, but your will be done. I want the family made whole. And so he was willing to endure such gruesome, gruesome beatings and mistreatment, ridicule, the shame that was put upon him for us. Despising the shame that, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. That should be what Christ did for us, and the Father did by sacrificing his Son. It should be the solidifying fact. Is there anything he's going to withhold from you that's right? Is he going to allow you to be destroyed? The man that gave his precious son to go through gruesome, the most horrific death that's ever been recorded in history. It pleased him to have his son crushed for us. He's not going to let us down. He's, and if we get an answer, no, it's for our benefit. So let's not gripe. Let's not be as the children of Israel and have that attitude where we murmur. Let us praise him because he's done so many great things for us. Praise God.